warning, some viewers may find this content disturbing. Viewer discretion is advised. from small town monsters. This is absolutely legendary to see you here in the Fox Den tonight for another episode of Midnight Lycanthropy here on Star Fox Radio. We are going to find out information about the dog man. Much better. Now that I feel fully recharged, revamped, and I feel my powers oozing through my veins, it is now time for Heather and myself to take a walk into the darkness. My creatures of the night, yes, welcome back to another episode of Midnight Lycanthropy here on Star Fox Radio. I do hope everyone has been well. I have been extremely busy myself. And guess what? Our host tonight slash guest, oh boy, she's been super busy as well. And to be quite honest, is considered a legend in my eyes. We have Heather from Small Town Monsters sitting down with us tonight. How are you doing, my friend? Oh my goodness. I am so excited to be here. Thanks for having me on. Um, Like you said, I've been busy, but uh, looking forward to having this conversation. Yes, I do encourage anyone that is listening. I will have links up for everything, but if you do enjoy my content, well, Small Town Monsters is definitely a whole cinematic presentation as well. So I do encourage everyone to pop over there. They are churning out stuff pretty much about as quickly as I am, except larger presentations. So it's great stuff and I do appreciate it. And I've learned a ton on my own accord and call myself a fan of you also to have you here is definitely excellent. What have you been up to? And do you want to give the audience kind of a plug about who you are and what you do? Yeah, sure. So uh, my name is Heather Mosier. I am a producer and researcher for Small Town Monsters, which is a documentary film company based out of Ohio, and we talk about uh, monsters and their effect on small towns and communities, um, not only how it affects the, the people that have had experiences, but like I said, the community as well. So we've run the, the gamut here. We've done movies on Bigfoot. We've done movies on Dogman, The Bell Witch, Jersey Devil, um, and we just keep coming up with the uh, new content as often as we can. Like you said, we're churning out a lot of stuff. So you can find our movies on like Amazon or Vudu. Um, Some of them are streaming on Tubi, but we always have content coming out on YouTube, like on a weekly basis, we have new stuff coming out on YouTube. So you can check our YouTube out for free and yeah, see what, see what we're getting into each week. Beautiful. And as I said, yes, they have a ton of stuff. And I was actually, when I was working on one of my podcasts the other night, I obviously had to have it muted because, you know, copyright issues, et cetera. So, but I was watching one of your documentaries in the background that I'd already seen numerous times on Tubi. Just so when I would look up from my phone, obviously I knew what was being said and stuff. So great. I do appreciate it all. And you're right down in what I like to call werewolf square. Cause Aaron Deese has the cool term dog man triangle. And I was looking 
because long story short is I'm the journalist, historian, and basically graphics designer and videographer for the North American Dogman Project. And we have a ton of Google map pings that we are updated on, but also extremely backed up on. And what I was looking at is on our map, where I like to call Werewolf Square, because I was inspired by Aaron. You have Wisconsin, you have Michigan, you have Ohio, you have the LBL, Kentucky, Tennessee, you have parts of Pennsylvania and West Virginia. All right up in there is the heart of pretty much dogman country in regards of where there's huge clusters of sightings. And I wanted to ask what were potentially some of the more interesting ones in your area that you've had a chance to work on, or maybe potentially that some of the ones you felt were more nightmare fuel. So I am in Ohio. And uh, so in that, in that square, like you said, but some of the ones in this area, I mean, as far as older ones, there's the Defiance Werewolf, which was a dog man that wielded a two by four to beat somebody over the head, <laughs> over the head. Um, that's an older story. But then we have um, other tales, which were outlined in American Werewolves 1, I guess I should say. It's the first American Werewolves installment that we did. Um, we had a couple sightings that we recounted there. And one of them was uh, by, we call him the judge. Uh, his name is Shane. And it's whenever he was in high school and he was uh, running late at night uh, amidst some cornfields. And something was like keeping pace with him on and off. He would stop, it would stop, he would run, it would run. Um, and he couldn't he couldn't see it, but he could hear it in the corn. And then when he got to the ed, end of the cornfield, then um, he turned to look and saw this creature that looked more like an Anubis type creature. Um, and, uh, that one has stuck with me particularly because of the, the comparison to Anubis. Right. Um, and to me that's, I don't know, a sleeker version of a werewolf. Um, it's just very distinctive, um, and not typically necessarily what you would think when it comes to a werewolf in general, pretty much, all of the Dogman stories I've heard are nightmare fuel, to be honest, because uh, Dogman never seems to have a, a nice presence about him that I have heard anyway. Um, the closest that I can think of to neutral would be a story that we got when we were filming um, Skinwalker Howl of the Ruguru. And the Ruguru, again, it showed up in an Anubis type form. But uh, when it showed up to the, to the girl, it was after she had disturbed uh, some Native American uh, artifacts that were outside. And then this creature showed up in her room at night and would tell her that she needed to put it back, not disrespect her, her ancestors and so on. And um, she ignored this for several nights. And after like the third or fourth night of this creature showing up, it would get closer and closer to her bed. Finally, it scared her into, okay, I'll put everything back. And she put it back. And that's like the most, passive that I've heard of a dogman encounter <laughs> just the gentle nudging I guess but still she was filled with fear where some of these other stories um I mean they they range up clear up to what you hear at LBL with the massacre right um it's just terrifying well spoken right there and I appreciate you sharing all that I've heard of a few of those and I never got a chance directly myself to speak to the judge but Jody Cook and some others who had a chance that are part of the North American Dogman Project I actually was able to document that encounter through their sit down with him so yes I agree with you fully that it is all straight up nightmare fuel and before i touch on something else i wanted to ask are you familiar with the case that happened in the 80s in germantown where officials were going up and down the street on the loudspeaker telling everyone that they needed to go back inside so when you say germantown the germantown werewolf uh name resonates with me but i do not i cannot think of the story right now so can you tell me more about it of course. And also, this kind of ties in with the Butter Street Beast as well. 
It's all pretty much clustered up in that area. Officials are going up and down telling everyone you need to go inside because wolves had escaped from the local nature reservoir. And people were thinking, well, wait, you know, these are wolves that are pretty much almost domesticated. We see them all the time and et cetera. They're very familiar with humans. But OK, obviously, if they're telling us to go inside, we need to go inside. So. Everyone went inside and throughout the whole entire night and from that point on to modern day, people had reported, especially that night, weird looking canine creatures with glowing eyes trying to open their doors, windows, howling outside, and it was all across Germantown. And that's actually one of the more infamous cases that in our new documentary with the North American Dogman Project that we're working on that should hopefully be out in the fall. We have a ton of stuff that we were able to document during that and yeah that's a straight up nightmare fuel right there yeah absolutely i can't imagine if you're (laughs) if you're actually being told by law enforcement to uh you know stay inside your home and then other things happen beyond that i'd feel like it was the beginning of the purge or something (laughs) yes no straight up and so i wanted to basically here at the north american dogman project we break it down into three sections potentially paranormal base extraterrestrial or physical and we have people that specialize in all aspects and there's been reports that come in and every type of aspect that i just mentioned and i personally have a book that i'm working on that's in pdf form that is around almost 540 pages ranging back from 290 bc with the cynocephali all the way up to a few days ago and i still have a ton that i'm backed up on that i have yet to even put in the installment of my book. So I would like to say I kind of try to specialize a little bit more in the aspect of the physical side, uh, the physical encounters where I believe that something is in the same presence as you and I or a lion or anything else. And when we look at animals that are supposedly extinct, like giant cave bears, which spend around 90% of their time in caves, they would come out to feed and go back in and just roam around cave hyenas dire wolves and dire wolves aren't even related to modern day canines and also the dinopithecus which is the enormous baboon sized human apes all these supposed animals went extinct around 11,000 to 12,000 years ago which is just a blink of the eye and when you look at the areas that they lived in they all would especially the hyenas and the cave bears and dire wolves would spend a lot of time in the cave systems where the atmosphere has definitely not changed that much in comparison to what it was back then and also even the environment outside in the northwest and areas that they were prevalent in again hasn't changed that much and also it is proven that we had north american hyenas and european hyenas and again they probably most likely came up on the land bridge just like other animals did and i mean if the russian soldiers at one point in time were able to come across the ice land bridge to start a war then obviously animals could be and our environmentalists definitely is very optimistic that hyenas and baboons are extremely hardy creatures and again all the same food sources that they would have had are still potentially available yeah they're a little bit smaller but they're easier to catch for them so we believe i shouldn't say we i believe in some other people that a lot of the sightings of when someone uses the term dog man is yes it looks like a canine to them but a hyena is not a canine they're related to mongoose and civets also bears are not canines nor are dire wolves technically and nor are baboons and baboons are quadrupedal and bipedal and we have a ton of reports of their gait being in that motion and if someone has not ever had a chance really to look at baboons i encourage them they do look like werewolves they have pointy ears and certain versions have glowing eyes because they've adapted to deal with leopards at night and they have hands they open windows etc so i seem to think that maybe half of these sightings are involved in either seeing relatives of these extinct animals or actual versions that have been brought here by humans to potentially either be held as pets or on game reservoirs like spotted hyenas, baboons, because if a hyena 
can survive in Africa where everything is out to munch on you and you brought them up to Arizona, places like California, well, Africa gets cold at night as well. And they're still going to be able to dig their burrows and go in the cave systems and be totally fine now without dealing with lions. And I just wanted to basically get your thought on that whole hypothesis slash theory I've been trying to manifest. I like that a lot. Um, and, and you're right that there are there are many sightings that overlap with some of the creatures that you mentioned as far as the characteristics go. Even in, um, I know when Aaron Deese was writing Dogman Triangle, um, he had found some stories where uh, there were creatures that were discussed more so like hyenas than anything else. That was the closest representation that the people could come up with was a hyena, seeing a hyena run across the the prairie. I don't know. I think that that's, that's a pretty awesome thought process. I can definitely see how that could be a possibility. And this is coming from someone, of course, who is not a scientist, but based on what you're, what you explained, um, I think that that's totally probable. And um, I don't know, there's, the thing is, is there's so many weird things out there that we don't know about that I find it hard to rule out too much in general. Um, this goes with the physical world as much as the paranormal world. So that's kind of where I am. It's tough to rule any possibilities out. No, I totally appreciate what you just said, and I respect that. And thank you for taking a second to listen to all that. And I try to be as scientific based as possible. Again, I'm not a scientist either. I'm just a journalist, but we do have a science team. We have a geologist, we have an environmentalist, we have a master tracker slash survivalist, and we are trying to get a few biologists and potentially a few zoologists on with our squad too. So, you know, that way when I do get a chance to speak to people that are, you know, in the scientific community that have clout, I can sit down and just really explain like what I just explained to you. Hey, people are missing in these areas. There's cave systems. We have unknown footprints to the untrained eye would look like a bear, but bear prints look very much like hyena prints. We have prints that look like they're baboonish. What are these all doing here, you know, in North America? And then I can, again, talk about the ancestors and really have a conversation where if they don't want to speak to me afterwards, that is okay. And I'm not offended. I can then defer to my tracker. Okay. Because sure, I can answer all these questions, but yeah, I don't have any sort of scientific stamp on my name, but here, go talk to Nuxium. He can explain all this. Okay. You don't want to talk to him. We'll go talk to our environmentalist, Colleen. Okay. You don't think she knows enough about caves and such. We'll go talk to our geologist, William. Now, it's really hard to keep pushing people aside that actually have degrees and specialize in these aspects. And I always try to make sure that I will field anything dogman based because, like I said, to me, it's all under this category of things that look like bear man, bearzilla, coyote man, fox man, dog man, et cetera. But I believe skinwalkers, werewolves, et cetera, are something different than the dog man. I believe that the dog man is what I stated to you, a portion of existing physical animals, which is why when they've been hit by cars, they have crawled off and there's been blood wounds. People have shot at them. They scream, spit up blood, et cetera. But then there's other cases like you had mentioned earlier that seem to be more paranormal based maybe manifestations, which are things I don't really know enough about. So when I do hear those type of encounters, I make sure to send those to people of the North American Dogman Project that specialize in extraterrestrial or paranormal based aspects. Yet I do have an interesting hypothesis, meaning I think we've all had this where you wake up and you're half awake, but you're not really awake. So you're still kind of in the dream realm. So what seems real might not be real. And I'll give an example. I don't know how many times where I've woken up from a dream that seemed awesome, where one of my girlfriends from the past when I was younger that I thought well, I was going to marry, we were on vacation on this beach, whatever, seems so real, right? And then I wake up, I'm in my room, in my bed by myself. There is no ex anywhere inside. I haven't spoken to her in years. So, but it seems very real. Okay. And I'm wondering sometimes maybe if people are having a nightmare because it is proven if you eat sugar and foods before bed, that doesn't it definitely affect your dreams. So I'm wondering sometimes maybe if some of these 
manifestation ones in their room where people are waking up and seeing it sure maybe they really are seeing it but i'm also wondering if they're still maybe in a dream slash nightmare type state yeah i think that's definitely possible to to have nightmares about such things but then i think the other aspect of that is to dive into why does it manifest in that way like if you're having a dream about an ex part of that could be because you had been thinking about them or maybe something had triggered some sort of memory but when you're having a dream about something that looks like a dog man like why did your brain put all of these pieces together to manifest into that particular creature and why is is that something that seems to repeat amongst other humans it's not like that's a unique thought process either you know um and i think that's worthy of study as well Again, amazing. And that's why I always try to be subjective and objective. And I like to say I'm a healthy skeptic, meaning I've never had any sort of paranormal encounters or activity. I'm a journalist. I just try to document things and figure out what it is that's occurring. And again, I really don't know anything about paranormal stuff. But I was wondering, maybe say if demons and negative energy is really a thing. And I do know I'm super spiritual and stuff, so I just try to be a good person, really good to animals, my friends, people I care about, et cetera. But I do know in the past when I was more boohoo and I wasn't happy with who I was and I wasn't projecting the most positive energy, it would seem like more negative things would occur. Yet now that in the past 10, 15 years, I've really tried to change on things I didn't like about myself, et cetera, and be a good person. Now I've just noticed a lot of positive things occurring. And I'm wondering potentially, as I stated, negative energy, you know, manifestations, et cetera. I wonder if they know because Hollywood has always installed fear with vampires and werewolves, et cetera. Maybe if they take that form on because they just know it's already manifested in our head as nightmare fuel. Mm, I like that thought process too. Um, something being aware of that and, and that be why it manifests as such. Um, yeah, I like that. I like that a lot. No, thank you again. I appreciate that. Like I said, I just always try to look at it first. Okay, plugging the pieces as to what scientifically or rationally could be occurring. And then when things start not really fitting into places like that, then it's okay. Well, now there's definitely something else that needs to be looked at outside of the box. And I mean, like, for example, sure, yes, people could be zapped in areas and have their electronics go all out. And yes, 100 percent. But also, like our geologist said, there are rocks and minerals that when they clash together and the tectonic plates are moving, which are like conveyor belts, those type of minerals and rocks have magnetic poles and forces. And we know cold and heat affects batteries, et cetera. So there are definitely sometimes logical reasonings as to why something electronic could all of a sudden be having an issue. Because if you are in an area where there is a magnetic pole naturally from rocks and things, of course, it's going to affect your compasses and the way things are occurring. And then also, where is we now as people are always scared and such so if we're going out into the forest and we're already worked up and we just watched a horror movie we are obviously going to be fully on edge which is a natural instinct that we have had which is a reason why we survived because there were points and times in the past when yes loud noises meant bears and predators and other tribes coming to get us yes but now sure loud noises out there still could mean some of that but it also we are hyping ourselves up with horror movies and all this. So when we go out there and we hear, oh, wow, someone threw a rock. But that could have also been an acorn. I live in an area when I hear acorns hit the roof sometimes, it, not directly to my house, but some of the other ones, it's crazy loud. It's like, bang. And I mean, it leaves dents on people's car. Also, tree breaks. I mean, sure, yes, if it's super high, interesting. But also, I drive by all the time in an area because there's trees all up here in Maine and you just see random kind of tree breaks but it's just trees break from the wind up here and the weather that's occurring and also i mean when things fall it, technically tree branches could make a kind of a weird structure when it fell but also yes it may not be and that's why i just try to logically look at all these things first and never really try to ever not use the word potential because as I said, you know, until someone's able to 100% solidify like they've been able to do a Sasquatch with the DNA and, you know, the professors, it is all potential. So when someone sends me a 
what they say, hey, this is a dog man print. To me, it's a potential. Um, even if we're not able to verify what it is, we still 100% don't know what it is. So even though we don't know, it doesn't mean it's a dog man print. Yeah, exactly. I think that that's a good way to go about it too, um, because we don't have definitive proof of any of these cryptids really. So um, to be skeptical is a good idea, but not be so dismissive. You know, Mm -hmm. Um, there's a fine line between being skeptical and being cynical. Um, And I think that that's a a fine line that people need to walk. Um, But uh, yeah, I I agree with you. And, And here in Ohio as well, there's tree breaks all over the place. I mean, you can go out in the woods and see them just for the same reasons you said, whether it's wind or another branch breaks and it falls on another branch and then you have weird structures. Um, so yeah, um, you see those things pretty readily. It's the, it's the oddities that get your attention or should get your attention. I suppose if you're looking into something like that. Yes, 100%. And I, again, think it's super good. Like you said, as long as it's done in a healthy way, healthy skepticism is okay. Healthy skeptical questions are okay. I feel like when people get offended by those, a lot of times I get the vibe that they're hiding something, meaning they want to control the narrative when they report things to us. Oh, we can't come to their property to look at things, or they claim all this activity is happening, but then it's just one footprint. And like our tracker says, well, they could have sat there all day working on that one footprint. Where are the rest of them? A dog man doesn't just leave one footprint. That would be something like a bird would potentially be doing, meaning he was able to debunk some things that were blue heron in an area of the snow that were three toed. They looked interesting, but also, like he said, there's no way something by Peterly would have been walking like that. He's like, it almost looks like it was hopping. So he looks at his casting, sure enough, it matches up with the blue herring. And that's something I really tried to, like I said, just encourage to people is when you are taking pictures of evidence or such, you know, don't just take one footprint, take a video of the track pattern, the area of where this encounter is occurring. And like I said, I really do also encourage people, it's okay to be respectful, but ask these quality, healthy, skeptical questions, because I feel like a lot of times there's these encounters out there where the narrative is fully controlled, meaning for some reason the tougher questions aren't asked and everyone just automatically assumes these stories or encounters have occurred. And in a perfect world, yes, we would love to take human testimonial as 100% credible but yet look at the beginning of time and all the way up to modern day human beings hoax they lie etc i mean how many times have hoaxes come out where potentially i was like wow that looks so interesting like the gable film when i was younger and you know how it was so fake and people still try to flex on it as wow that's an actual real dog man slash werewolf when that was debunked by monster quest and a bunch of other people when i was back in high school and when i was 11 teen yeah i totally understand um it's it's tough whenever you're talking to witnesses i mean a lot of it as as far as a researcher goes you have to kind of go off of your gut instinct a lot of times as far as whether um whether and i i hate i hate doing this i hate saying whether someone's credible or not because that's not really I don't know. That seems really rough. Um, no, but it's so true, though, my friend. I mean, like, honestly, though, like, before you finish, like, I mean, that is so true, though. It's OK, because we need credible people, people that have credence to that. And it's credibility isn't something that's just given. It's earned throughout life with just doing things that you as a person say with your words. So, no, continue. That's great. Right. Yeah, That. that's um. I mean. That's where it comes into play, you know, when we get testimony from people that are former law enforcement and our teachers or things like that. Um, people with profession that have, have a little higher standing, like with morality, I guess you would say, then um, sometimes their words will hold hold more weight to them just straight out the gate. I don't know. I also see red flags, regardless of what someone's profession is, if, mm-hmm. like you said, they say that they have all of this evidence, but you can't come over and check it out. Um, or, uh, they, they've had all of these experiences, but they can't, they can't explain all of it to you. They can only tell you one or two things that have happened. Um, and 
I can understand certain things because this, this happens in the Bigfoot world a lot as well, where people will say, well, I don't want people coming over because I don't want them to interfere with the creatures that are here. And I get that. I understand that. But also for the sake of the species, if this is a species, then there has to be some sort of studying done. And the only way that that's going to occur is if you get people out there to study the phenomenon, right? So um, you have to open up somewhat um, beyond just saying, yeah, I have these experience. Yeah, there's a whole family that lives on my property, but I don't want anybody out here to, to check them out. I understand being picky because there are people that will just want to come out because they're nosy or whatever. Um, and you don't want hunters out and so on. But there are people that are legitimately in this for the science of it. And those are the people that you need to contact and get out on your property and, and take note of these things. Again, so well stated. And you have a great mind frame, which, I mean, I've never had a chance to even speak to you until now. But pretty much from the research that I've done and watched and everything and how you present yourself, you're a great researcher and put out an amazing product. So kudos. And it is super important just to, yes, keep an open mind, but also use natural intuition to realize when our chains are being yanked. Like one of my friends one time fielded a call about a gentleman that claims he raised a dog man pup from day one all the way up until when it went deceased. And this gentleman was crying on the phone. And well, guess what? We all kind of came to the conclusion because it's not just myself or Jody or Shane or other members of the North American Dog Man Project that come to the conclusion. We present it and we basically come to the conclusion with like a not a round table but you see what i'm saying like it's it's a bunch of us that we all respect how we bring insight to a topic before we figure out well no we're not documenting this or well this is interesting or yeah we are going to document that and we all came to the conclusion that this gentleman was definitely yanking our chains and it's one of those things that, like I said, it's unfortunate, but it happens. And meaning the other day, I, I was looking through a ton of emails and I was like, wait a second, I've heard this encounter before. And I'm looking through my book, looking through my book. Boom. Sure enough, I have it. So this gentleman at one point in time had already submitted this encounter to us that the things that stood out for the most part, it was the same, but a couple big differences. There were a difference in the date, two years difference, and also completely different counties in Ohio. Yes, they were near each other, but to me, I didn't even need to re-reach out to that guy because now that automatically is a red flag because he obviously wasn't smart enough to realize he had submitted this in story previous and it's two years difference, a different location. And yeah, it's obviously somebody, unfortunately, trying to troll us. Yeah, the difference in location would be something that would be a red flag for sure, especially if um, it was something as intimate as raising a pup. <laughs> I would think that that would be something that you would not mistake. Is I mean, I can see something if you were driving down the road and you weren't quite sure where you were and you were kind of guesstimating what county you were in or if you were near a county line or something, but not something that was so intimate as raising a pup, no. Yeah, so it's like we never call these individuals out, but it's just afterwards that's something that we will never reach out to them again or if we do catch somebody being fraudulent we're not going to ever reach out to them again we're never going to post their evidence and we are going to put that evidence in the file of debunked because it is important that if we ever want to get this to a scientific level people really need to stop using paradoia images people need to stop thinking all this AI, I'm a graphics designer, okay? Like I know what can be done with AI, what filters can be done, how you can make something look like it's from the 40s, 50s, and it's really grotesque how many times in these groups I am in where people that I respect post <laughs> these posts and I'm, they're like, wow, this has got to be the best dogman or Sasquatch footage I've ever seen. And I'm like, wow, that is so AI. It's ridiculous. And you see some people in the chat, like Ryan Tremblay and some other people that have helped debunk things where you're like, OK, yeah, they obviously know. But then you see all these people like, 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 oh, wow, it looks like a juvenile dogman. Yeah, AI is <laughs> AI is going to be uh, troublesome for us, I think, for sure. I've One thing that I've noticed as far as and not even looking at modern day sightings, what I've seen typically in these groups that get people going are the ones that do look older. Like you said, um, and I'm talking like early photographs 
period, as in the first time that we're able to take photographs, people are saying, look at this Bigfoot that was strung up by a tribe out in wherever they come up with. And it's clearly AI because the people in the picture have like seven to eight fingers, um, you know, or their feet don't look right, whatever. But at first glance, if you're not familiar with AI, yeah, it does look rather convincing. Um, And I think that that's something that we're going to have to come up with or like we're going to have to deal with more so in the coming years than we've ever had to deal with before. And the same thing, unfortunately, goes with written testimony, because now we're dealing with AI actually coming up with stories. They're coming up with entire tales. Um, I have I'm one of my other jobs is a, a classics professor, and I have students that will turn in completely AI written essays. Um, there are certain telltale signs, but in general, um, if you're, I, I'm sure that you're familiar with this. Sometimes when people send you their witness testimony, um, it's not written in like perfect academic standards by any means. It's, it's usually written just however they, they're thinking. And mm-hmm. so you don't, you're not going to go off of, well, this person misspelled this word. So clearly it's AI or, you know, whatever. Um, but AI can come up with stories like this. So you're going to have to be more um, even more keen eyed when it comes to things that are coming in your email inbox. As far as that goes, it's just, it's going to be never ending when we're against AI. Your students thinking they can flex on you, get out of here. eh? (laughs) It it is so true though, because I can, before we let you go here, definitely verify that. I mean, my book, okay. It's, it's a rough draft. I still have I really honestly, once I'm all caught up with the old content I had to put up, long story short with that is I lost rights to my intro and outro that someone had done CGI a while ago. I didn't have the money to renew it. I was capable of redoing my own intro and outro. Well, I really need to get monetized. So I had to redo all my stuff, which is okay. I have 29 episodes back up, which is great. A lot better than zero, but yes. So it does take time, you know, to get that stuff and push it out there. And but I, like I said, I do understand 100% with the lack of proper vocabulary because on my book, for example, yes, it's full rough draft form. When someone was reading it, I definitely know for a fact that I go from first person to second person sometimes because <laughs> it's not finished yet. I'm just trying to sure. get the information in there so that when I do get a chance to actually sit through and correct it, I'm like, wow, that's a horrible sentence structure. Yes, <laughs> that's awesome. Well, thank you again so much for taking time out of your super busy schedule to hang out with us tonight here. And I do appreciate all the knowledge and the awesome research you do. And I would at some point love to collaborate with you again when you get some time and definitely make sure to keep on rocking it. Thank you so much for having me on. This has been awesome. Thank you for everyone who once again stopped by tonight for another episode of Midnight Lycanthropy here on Star Fox Radio. If you do enjoy my content, please like, subscribe, and share it. Feed the algorithm, and I will see you on the next one.